Hi folks, welcome back and thank you so much for joining. So today, fire retardants for candle wicks. Sounds a bit counterintuitive, right? I mean, a candle is something that you set on fire. Why would we need fire retardants? Well, there are very important reasons why and it has to do with fire safety. And we're going to explore those reasons we're going to learn how fire retardants work, in particular, for candle wick. What value does it add to the candle and the fire safety aspect of it? And then we're going to mix up a formula that I have used myself for over a decade. And I'm going to explain why I think that this is my top choice for a fire retardant used on candle wicks. So let's get started. Okay, so let's go over it. Uh, what we're going to concentrate on is how cotton cellulose reacts to flame. So we are going to draw us a little flame here. Now, inside the flame, you'll see the wick, it curls up, and the flame just completely wraps inside the flame usually you'll see it it's orange yellowish and that is the carbon zone so that creates problems during the burn uh, not just the fact that it's uh, carbon is bad for breathing but it can accumulate on the wick, shielding it from the heat, the same way that the flame retardant turns the wick black, but the carbon becomes too thick so that it is shielding the wick and preventing it from burning off right here at this edge. So as you can see, as the candle burns down, the wick can continue to get longer and at some point it can actually protrude from the flame. That can become very dangerous. Now what we're going to do to solve that is with flame retardant. We're going to apply chemistry to this and it's going to help keep that trimmed off. And I'm going to dig down deep and show you exactly how that happens. Now, another consideration for candle wicks is if there's no flame retardant on it at all. Well, then this becomes a gray ash. So it could be black. If it's carbon, if it's gray, that is ash. That ash can also drop and support a flame so that can become dangerous too so we have two ends of the spectrum that we have to control with one flame retardant and we can do that very effectively and i will dig down deep and show you exactly what's going on step by step as we develop this chemistry to the point where it is safe to use for candles all right so we're going to do a bit with the board but I'm going to show you some close-ups, okay, of a wick burning and what stage by stage, what the chemistry looks like as it is improving the burn characteristics of the wick. And I think you're going to be quite surprised once we dig down how flame retardants actually do their job. All right, so there's are essentially five different types of 
fire retardants and um, they work differently depending on the type of material so uh, there are a class of fire retardants that would be considered fire shields There's bromide, there's halogen, there's phosphor. I don't use them, so uh, bromide, halogen, phosphor. How could I forget our friend nitrogen? Okay, so these are not the types that would be well suited at all as used as a flame retardant for a candle wick. Uh, these, uh, they, uh, some of them into mass. The phosphor, it uh, develops a glass shield around the wick, making it very stiff and rigid, not allowing it to do its job, which is to get to the edge of the flame where it can be moderated by self-trimming at the edge of the flame. Now the edge of the flame of course is 2700 degrees plenty for just about obliterating anything. Okay so but what we use for candle wicks is an inorganic. Okay it is a mineral. Mineral wash And it acts differently than these. These, they form a protective shield against the flame from getting to whatever is underneath. However, an inorganic mineral wash actually lowers the point the cotton burns so that it ignites even more easily. Now what that does is it quickly develops a carbon shield. And that carbon shield is what absorbs the heat, radiates the heat, and protects the material underneath. Now in terms of a candle wick, we actually, we want this thing to completely char 100%. And that is good because even once it is completely burned up, the body of the wick is still there so that it is able to suck up through capillary attraction the wax to the flame. Now, I may have pulled a fast one on you there. I switched from fire retardant to flame retardant because that is the type of uh, action that's going on with a candle wick. We're not actually fire retarding it, but we are moderating the flame through the chemistry. And we can do that by adjusting how much of the wick is exposed to the flame at any time and we do it by as the wick bends through burning it's going to reach the edge of the flame now uh, not all wicks will trim uh, it has to be a braided wick a flat ply braided wick the construction of a flat ply braided wick naturally when it burns it wants to curl either way it doesn't matter which end they they both curl so it's uh, omnidirectional so let me clean up the board real good here and uh, I'm going to move the camera in closer and I'm going to light some wicks on fire and you're going to see the differences between an untreated wick and one that has flame retardant applied to it. And then a few variations in between where too little or too much and how that could be a problem. So a lot to do here. Uh, let me make some candles and I'll be right back. 
All right. So in the time that it takes for our to watch a valuable YouTube ad, I have got these made. And I have three different concentrations here. I've got zero, so there's no flame retardant on this one. There's 3% on this one, and then there's 25% uh, on this one. This is uh, uh, going to show you, I, I hope, in no unclear demonstration here, the importance of flame retardants and getting the percentage just right. So uh, I thought I would include this and in how I made these. Uh, folks are always scratching their heads on uh, the tall skinny candles. For testing purposes, this is ideal here. It is a straight side. It finishes at the thickness that I need to determine the efficacy of the wick and the flame retardant as it responds to this wax and does it create a safe burn. So I get to the information quickly this way. And if you want to make something like these, well, Here's where I found them. Everyone has seen these little uh, stick, steak solar lights that supposedly lights up your path. And um, I bought these uh, because I was interested in the perovskite uh, solar cell right here. Um, in my opinion, solar panels do not need to last 25 years. So uh, I'm researching that. But what's left over is this. We all know that those things, they go bad in about a year. Either they get wet, they wear out, who knows? And they end up being thrown in the trash. And we've got a hard plastic here. Uh, we've got uh, nice stainless steel here. And of course, on top, some plastic. But inside, there's a little reflector. And this is what intensifies the light. And these all play a part in my speed making of reproducible test candles. They're all the same size, the same length, so everything is simply ideal. And it was something that gets thrown in the trash. Let me recall how I did this. Okay. That little reflector that I popped out actually <clears throat> holds the wick in place and the hole is directly center of the uh, sleeve so everything just seems to work out just right and as you can see how I am using reusing some of the components here Right. <clears throat> Pull the wick taut. Look down the body and make sure that the wick is not twisted much. Drape it over like that. Apply a piece of tape for your wax. And you'll end up with this. Make sure when you pour that you pour a little wax over the wick as much as you can because you want to prime the wick. And you want to trim them all at the same length. Thereabouts. I've marked these so that I know what the chemistry is. And we'll get to that in just a moment. What you see here <clears throat> is I'm about to conduct a test burn, and I take lighting a fire very seriously. So I'm going to sh uh, explain why I'm using these. Whenever you test a candle, and I suggest when you burn a candle at home that you always put it in a metal container large enough to hold all of the wax should a problem occur. Even in a jar, the glass can break. So you want a metal container. Now, I've selected this as well because this, during burn, has the potential 
to fall over. So you need to select a container large enough also to handle a tip so that no wax or flame ever goes outside your metal container. All right, so now I'm simply going to melt these and stick them right to the bottom and it doesn't take a lot. This is a standard high temperature wax that I've added a little bit of color to just so it shows up a little better. All right. You can even uh, verify that it's perpendicular with a little level. But your eye is pretty good so we're going to see if that's going to be enough for that and we're just going to go and work down the line here All right, so we're set up now. Let's go over what we have here, okay? We have our candles in a metal pan large enough to hold all of the wax, wide enough to be able to catch the entire candle should it fall over. We have a little uh, bit of water right here, okay? And uh, I don't joke when it comes to fire safety. Let's, let's do this safely, so. That's what this video is about, showing you how to use flame retardants safely. All right, now, so let's uh, zoom in closely here. What I'm going to do first is we're going to test what I've done just the raw wick with a little bit of wax on it. And I have these. These are also wicks that I have applied the different concentrations of chemistry to. And we're going to try these out. These have, are bleached. They're a higher quality wick. So uh, we're going to see what that looks like as well. All right. We seem to have a little uh, background music provided by Jiminy Cricket. But we're going to go through this. What I'm going to do is conduct first a dry burn with these. And I'm going to start with the zero. While I'm burning these, I'm going to be explaining the things that we're going to be looking for along the way. So ignite about a half an inch. Now, as you can see here, the wick is burning away, and what you have is a white ash. And that's uh, very dangerous. You don't want that flying around. Because as you can see, uh, a bit of an ember is attached to it when it drops off. All right. Now you see how there are parts of it here. Now it's black. And that's a good thing. There we are. All right. And here is 3%. Once again, I'm going to uh, light about a half an inch. 
and uh, talk about what we should be seeing now. And as you can see, no gray ash. Okay, you do have some ember glow, and that is what is igniting the down deep inside the wick. But once the wick is completely charred, the ember glow stops and it continues to curl. This is ideally what you want. Now I'm going to huff this ember out. It won't go out yet, but uh, as you can see, the body of the wick is still there. It's flexible. That's ideal. And the ember has finally gone out. So what's happened here is the borax and the boric acid have worked together to create a black char where the body of the wick still remains and that body is what's going to continue to supply the wax to the flame. When you saw the ember glow finally go out, that was the action of the urea. And that's its job, is to evolve nitrogen to the flame, thereby removing oxygen. So it has worked in two ways. The black char has removed the fuel, and the urea has removed the flame. Now on this section here is 25 percent and you would think that uh, it would be even better. But this will in essence may be too much. One final test of your dry burn is to see if the edge of the flame of your torch can burn off the wick. And you should be able to chew the wick up to where there's nothing if you have the proper amount of flame retardant on it. And 25% is too much. This wick will be too strong and it will never trim at the edge of the flame. See, it's all still there, but I can't knock it back with the lighter. Let me show you what I mean, and I'm going to switch wicks just a little bit here. We're going to go back to the 3%, and I'm going to show you on something that's a little more sturdy. But the first thing I need is fire. There we are. Oh, I was off camera, but uh, as you can see, the body of the wick still remains. It's engulfed in an ember glow, so it is being consumed completely. And what we want for the 3% is to be able to chew the wick back at the edge of a flame. There we have it. There we have it, just like that. We want the edge of the flame to be able to walk back that wick and completely obliterate it. This is a safe percentage here. Let me once again show you with the 25 percent.
and then if you use too much, you won't be able to walk your wick back at the edge of the flag. Let's get a little bit more going here. All right. We're going to let it uh, calm down a bit. Let that ember glow completely develop that char down inside the wick. Okay, now we're going to try to walk it back. And you see, I'm not able to chew the wick back at the edge of the flame. So, this is too much. And here is with none. And believe me, this is the most dangerous kind. That gray ash is going to likely fly off and carry that ember with it as it goes. All right, so now we're going to light some candles. All right, so here we are. This is the no flame retardant wick, and we're going to light this. Now, I've already shown you why it's a dangerous wick, but it also can be very frustrating to your customer. If I can recreate a disaster <laughs> for the customer, uh, what happens to a candle wick that um, hasn't had flame retardant applied to it? What can quite often happen is the wick will continue to burn and turn into a gray ash. So uh, you burn the, the wick off right at the, you can't light it anymore. Here's 3%. Now what we're going to be looking for here is for it to completely turn black, of course, and get to the edge of the flame within 15 minutes. When I tested candles for approval, the wick had to make it to the edge of the flame by 15 minutes or it was a fail uh, because that is the point where it becomes in danger of collecting too much soot and carbon around the body of the wick creating too thick of a carbon shell so that it won't trim off at the edge of the flame as you saw with the uh, high percentage flame retardant. So I'm going to conduct a critical burn on this and uh, we're going to fast forward from here and you get to see four hours and you know what? Five seconds, ten seconds. All right, so as we can see, it's past the first test. Uh, it's 15 minutes, and the wick has curled to the edge of the flame. Therefore, therefore, the edge of the flame can continually trim that wick. The next test is to see if the wick is large enough to be able to consume all this wax without it dripping so we should see a nice cup not completely dry but certainly not all the way wet to the edge and you have to look closely to see that but you'll understand when you look what I'm talking about you need about a half full cup of melted wax and to the edge of the flame we'll be back in four hours Right, so we're about an hour in, and this uh, candle system is failing. I thought I would show this to you. Now, the flame retardant is working, and it's working great. 
even though this candle is failing, that flame retardant is making sure that this wick still maintains a certain height and it doesn't grow too large as to go outside of the flame. It's running down here, so the way to fix that is to use a bigger wick. But this percentage will work. Now something I like to do, because everyone does it, is to blow out the wick, blow out the flame, and see what happens. One of the things that I want to see is that the ember glow, the smoke evolving off of this candle, doesn't go beyond 10 seconds. And that was about 3 or 4 there. Now it's completely out. And it cannot be uh, a danger anymore. Now I'm going to light this once more to show you what happens if you ignore the smoldering smoke that is coming off of the flame or off of the wick once you blow it out. That smoke can be reignited and it jumps right back to the wick. So that would be a problem that we want to uh, mitigate. And we don't want that thing to smolder for very long. And the standard is 10 seconds. And this one goes 2, 3, maybe 4 seconds. So the chemistry is working. It's doing its job. What's failing here is we need a bigger wick. Okay, so let's move on to the one where we have too much. All right, this one is 25% and I'm going to light it. And the reason I made this is to show you what happens if you use too much flame retardant. All right, so at 15 minutes, 25%, it's not curling as well as you can see. It's a bit stiff and it has begun to drip already. So we're going to let this go, and uh, once it uh, gets to the point I want to show you, then I'll be back. All right, now we're at the point I wanted to show you, and that is the tip of the wick is extended beyond the flame now. What can happen is it can get chewed off back here and drop. So this is a very dangerous situation. You have a wick capable of holding a flame dropping down to the bottom of the candle and creating a second fire at the base. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's not trimming. And there's too much wick outside the flame here. Okay, there we have it. Okay, so let's go over the results one more time and then we're going to uh, make a mix. Now, in the photos that I'm including and um, I was, hope they turn out, <laughs> but however, the one with no flame retardant when we blew it out, what remained was a gray ash on the tip of the wick. Uh, that's uh, a fire danger, a fire risk. The one with 3% was the ideal percentage. Now this percentage will work for just about everything. Uh, a bigger wick will use the same amount. So what we have here though is just what we want. We want completely black, no gray, no white, nothing on the end, just solid black all the way to the very tip. The one with 25%, which uh, I really piled it on to illustrate for you what can go wrong if you get it wrong. Um, 
This one not only did not trim off at the edge of the flame, but it sort of dangled out at one point and the flame was chewing it off so that that little piece would eventually drop off and it's big enough to support a flame so therefore you would have a fire at the bottom uh, potentially. Okay, the second thing that I tried to show you in the photos was at the tip was a clear glass bead and that's the borax bead which is why you don't want to uh, go crazy with that. Use the boric acid so that you can cut way back on the borax. And of course, we all saw the ember glow times. They were all reasonable. And uh, that's because the um, urea, it helped to smolder out that ember glow so that that smoke cannot be reignited. Okay. So let's get to the mixing part. Oh, but before I go, uh, let me close out with this and uh, simply say that uh, most wicks have flame retardants on them. And um, a company, two companies that I can uh, assure you uh, get it right are uh, Weedoo, they're made in Germany, and Atkinson Pierce, made in the United States of America. Uh, so, if you if you just want to buy your wick, well, that that would be the way to go. However, if you um, if you want 100% control of what you're producing. Well, 100% is a good number. So, now, at the very least, when you are sizing your candles, you also have the information that you need to know exactly what wick you need for your particular candle. You'll know what to look for and what to avoid. All right. So now let's, <laughs> now let's get to the mix. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's mix up a bath, and um, the ratios that I put here are going to uh, determine the final characteristics of this wick as it uh, burns in the flame. Uh, now, this formula, it's not a secret. You just need to know where to look. and. Um, Wood is also cellulose, so I went to the United States Forestry Service and I used basically their components, but I used them just a little bit differently. In a forest fire, they use the boric, the borax and the boric acid to quickly develop that black char. What that does is removes the fuel from the flame. And then they go one step further, and that is to use the urea. Now that supplies a lot of nitrogen to the flame, thereby reducing the amount of oxygen the flame gets. So we're removing one more component from the fire, and that is oxygen. So we're, we're removing the fuel and the oxygen. As this occurs, of course, we're also reducing the heat of the flame, the BTUs, because the flame is getting smaller. There is no fuel to burn, so this prevents spread. Now. We're using these same components in our candle wick, but in different ratios, because what we want for the candle wick, of course, is we want the black char, we want no gray ash, we want a small borax bead, and we want to see it burn off cleanly at the edge of the flame. So what I have here is 200 milliliters of distilled water and to that I'm going to add my borax and then my boric acid and I'm going to mix those up together at first and then we're going to come back and we're going to add the urea.
All right, and now for the boric acid. Now, borax and boric acid are a synergistic compound. The boric acid helps the borax uh, considerably, and what it does is to help quickly form that black char that we want. So what we're going to want, of course, is the solid black char. This doesn't take a lot. Now the ratio that I'm putting together is a 4-1-1 ratio. Four parts borax, one part boric acid, and one part urea. Okay, so now I'm going to add the boric acid. And let's give this a bit of a stir. These chemicals are very safe to work with. You could uh, digest quite a bit. Uh, and the harm would be an upset stomach if you ate a lot. Now, the function of the urea has a very important function. Uh, like I said, this removes oxygen from the flame by evolving nitrogen. And what that's going to do is when you blow the candle wick out, as it continues to smolder, that is still a fire hazard because that smoldering smoke can be reignited. This is going to put that smoldering ember out quickly. That is not right. So. There it is. Now we're going to bring the temperature up to this, to where we are nearly boiling, and then we're going to put the wick in there and uh, let it stir inside the liquid for about a minute to fully saturate the wick. 